My name is Frank Collada. I am the last living gangster in Las Vegas. 360,000 dollar armed robbery that I committed and got away with. So I put six bullets in those head. And he ran. I looked at the gun like, did I miss this guy? I knew it was pressed against his head. He was a scared. I don't blame him. I met him in Stateville Penitentiary. And once a week he would kill an inmate. We just put him in a bag, but nobody ever said anything about it. It was just another guy who committed suicide. I was a product of my environment. I didn't know any better. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mob Vlog. Adam Flowers here. It is February 2nd, uh, it's Redna's Day, and we have Red Met with us today, and uh, we also have a special guest that's coming on. Uh, it's going to be the first time that we've ever done this on the show, so stick around. It's going to be really interesting, uh, and the special guest that we have uh, is a pretty damn interesting story. I mean, really interesting, really interesting guy. So, uh, if you guys are uh, just tuning in, just getting here, hit the like button and uh, just wanted to say uh, 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 it's Bob Vlog. Okay, so we're going to jump right into this. Red Wimet, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Adam. Excellent. And uh, we're doing things a little differently today. Uh, we're not using, as you can notice, Red's there is on his telephone. And uh, and that's because I have uh, this little device sitting next to my uh, speaker. And uh, I, I, I hope that everybody can hear Red all right. Uh, you want to say hello to everybody, Red? Hello, folks. How you doing today? I saw that you got snow out there in Chicago. And uh, in the chat, if you guys just let me know, give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can uh, that you can hear, uh, that would be great. And uh, that way we can bring in our uh, our guest today, because I'm telling you, it's going to be... Uh, thank you. It's clear. I'm th clear. Thank you, Don Ciccio Di Porzalo. I appreciate you letting me know that. And uh, with all that said, uh, we're going to bring in our uh, our guest. I want to say a quick, couple of quick hellos to you guys, though, because uh, it's it's you guys that run this thing. It's you guys that uh, that makes this uh, all happen. So if you're just tuning in, you don't know the format, jump ahead a couple of minutes and you get right into the meat of this. I just want to say hello to uh, Anthony, uh, <sighs> Anthony Demartini, Don Berlin. Uh, by the way, Don, uh, this show today is happening because of because of Don. All right. So you guys know. Uh, this is because of Don. So you can thank Don in the comments uh, for, for helping put this together because this is really going to be interesting today. Greg Bradshaw, uh, Howard Herman, everybody's talking about snow. Uh, I'm looking, it's sunshiny outside. Ah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, everybody's here on time. Chain Weaver, good to see you. Uh, John Kalagyros, Kalagyros, Kalagyros. All right, what's the over-under for butchering the names today, Red? I don't know. <laughs> Gomph is here. Sean Pender, Homan Sanders, Jim Magnifici, uh, Scott H., it's good to see you. Mike Alexander, Bobby Bag of Donuts, Connie Shine, William Kirchmayer, uh, Don Ciccio, Di Porzalo, Cody Stelly. It's good to see all of you. Luminous Grin, Lewis Cole. Mo, it's great to see you. Uh, Kirby, TC, Michael Graham, Alan White. Camille, Tappy, uh, Tapia, Wayne Moorcroft, uh, TC, Happy Chicks. You guys are all here. Pounding the pink veals even in the, in the Want house. A Want a show there. <laughs> yes. It's good to see all of you guys. And uh, Wanna Choa, G Money, Chain Weaver, uh, Raymond Rashoa. Hey, guy. How's it going? Good to see you. I'm starting to sound like Red now. Hey, guy. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so guys, I don't want to keep you in suspense any longer. Catherine Guerrero, good to see you. All right, so 
let's not leave you in the suspense. Let's let them know what's coming here uh, and, and what we're about to do. So uh, so we're good. The, the topic today, Red, is Chicago mob reporters, meaning news journalists, okay, reporters who focused on the mob. And turns out there is a lot of interesting history uh, around Chicago mob reporting. Really interesting history. So uh, we have a special guest. And well, the news bureau is very important. This man will explain it to you. What's well, that? That's a real, real good guy. He knows how to explain it to you. He's probably one of the last. His credits are outrageous. Adam, read him his credits. I, this, it, this is look. It is. Here, listen, listen to, 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 to who he is, okay? He's a former writer and reporter and legal affairs columnist for the Chicago Tribune. He began working a 23 career at the newspaper as an investigative reporter, winning a Pulitzer for his role in exposing... Anyway, he, the, he is... It, it's just amazing. He worked for the CNB back when news reporting was news reporting. They didn't put a, a slant to the left or to the right. They just reported the news. So uh, his name's William uh, William B. Crawford Jr. And uh, and and we're going to call him up and bring him on the show. Uh, Red and I just talked with uh, with Bill for a few minutes uh, before this, and it's, it was just fascinating. So if you guys have questions, you have comments uh, during the show today, put them in the side uh, in the comments here and and we'll ask them. We'll have a chance to an opportunity to ask them. And this is a really neat opportunity, guys, because um, and by the way, Anthony uh, Demartini put a video up yesterday. Thank you very much. It was a video about today's video. <laughs> so uh, if you guys haven't checked out Street Stories channel there, Anthony Demartini, please go over there and uh, click on his uh, uh, click on his uh, channel and check him out. He's a he's a hell of a guy. So um, <laughs> with all that said, great welcome to Mr. Crawford Street Stories, Anthony Demartini. Yes, uh, this is going to be this is going to be something. So. If you guys, because like I said, this is the first time that we're doing uh, something like this uh, on the show and bringing caller in, uh, this may uh, this may be a bit hairy for a second because I have to uh, I have to pull him up and uh, we're doing this. I mean, hey guys, this is hilarious, but I I, I went out and bought equipment, okay. <laughs> for bringing calls into a podcast to find out that I couldn't use this thing as a live switcher. So the next best thing is phone next to the microphone. I mean, it's as simple as that. So that's what we're doing. It's kind of primitive, but uh, it'll work. And uh, while I'm doing that, Red is going to sing to you. So take it away, Red. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Anything for you, Red? Anything for yeah. you? <laughs> uh, and didn't know. Stand on his head and do a magic trick. <laughs> didn't know that Red was an opera singer, guys. Huh? You didn't know that. No. But I really, I, I'm making a uh, a view of Carl Foster and all the all the other people that are coming in. Uh, thank all of you for stopping by. And don't forget to get to hit the like button if you like it. And at the very end, if you want Bill to come back, Adam will ask him if because he has more than he could say in one hour. That is it. Okay, so with that said, I think I have. Do I have everything in front of me here? Hold on. No, I don't. Hi, Ken. How you doing? Ken O'Neill. Okay, Red. I need you to sit tight. Hold on. I'm gonna bring uh bring Bill on the phone here. Okay. Got it. All right. And guys, just bear with me. It's snowing like hell back uh, in Chicago. Here, it's just coming down like crazy. All right, here we go. Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, hello, Bill. This is uh, Adam with Mob Vlog, and uh, I'm yeah, Adam, how are you? Doing great. How are you today? 
I'm doing all right. Thank hold, you. Hold on one second. Um, I'm just going to merge a call together here, Bill, so I can bring Red Fair One enough. Med in. Okay, Red, are you there? I am here. Bill, are you there? Oh, I am here. All Hello. right. Awesome. Well, so I gave a quick brief introduction, Bill, as to your uh, your career. But when when did you get started in journalism? Uh, and first off, can you also tell everybody how old are you? <laughs> Just turned eight old. Too 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 old. But uh, <laughs> so um, I, I attended the University of Chicago, which did not have a journalism school. Um, we got a liberal arts degree there got out uh, from college and um, taught uh, English for a couple of years. And I stumbled upon an entity known as City News Bureau of Chicago. Somebody said, hey, you ought to go over there. And I said, what do they do? And he said, they train people to write for newspapers. I said, they do? I'd never heard of such a thing. So I went over. They, they liked the interview. They, they hired me on the spot. And at the time, City News was owned by the four newspapers in Chicago uh, that published daily newspapers. And they used the, the City News as a place to train future journalists that they could hire um, and teach them how to write and so on and so forth. So I was there for two years at City News. The pay was deplorable. How I, how I made it, I don't, do not know. But I was there for two, hour, uh, two years. And at the end of two years, one day somebody tapped me on the shoulder at City News and said, Hey, the Tribune, Chicago Tribune wants to talk to you. So I went over and I was hired and I was at the Tribune for about 25 years. Um, I, I can tell you that I started as an investigative reporter. And in that era, the Chicago Tribune was unique throughout the, the country because it had a concept it had a, an entity known as the um, task force. And the task force was an investigative unit. It was made up of four people. And I got assigned to the task force. And what made it truly unique, the task force, is they did a sort of reporting in that era, which is no longer acceptable. Acceptable. It was put out uh, of business years ago, but it was undercover reporting. And what we would do is we would look at the task force, four members, would look at uh, a unit of, of government or life that appeared to have certain uh, potential corruption connected to it uh, in one way or the other. So we would investigate that for a while and we would decide whether it was uh, uh, it would make sense to get a job in that industry, for example, uh, debt collection industry, which was one of the first ones that we investigated. Um, we'd all get jobs at, uh, at the debt collection uh, uh, businesses throughout Chicago. We wouldn't tell them we were reporters, of course, um, and we would work there maybe two, three, four uh, months and, and collect all kinds of information undercover. And then at the end of like these were lengthy investigations, at the end of maybe four or five months, the four member unit would sit down in a little office and we would put together maybe a four or five part series um, and we would uh, tell the Chicago Tribune readers how we had actually worked in that business for, you know, four of us for four months, for example. Um, and uh, we do a four or five part series. We did that um, maybe four or five times during the two years that I was there. And um, eventually the Tribune was, got so much scolding and scoffing from fellow members of the industry, everything from the Columbia Journalism School um, uh, to fellow newspapers who scorned the concept of going in and misrepresenting uh, yourself in order to get a job. Um, so the Tribune finally bought into that and they, they uh, uh, disseminate or they uh, no, no, no longer did the undercover stuff. And I went back into investigative reporting at the Tribune, but no longer with a task force. End of comment. Wow. Um, that I have a question for you. Uh, did you work work on that uh, uh, Chicago Credit Authority? I'm sorry, which one? Chicago Credit Authority. Uh, as a matter of fact, we 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 did um, uh, we did a lengthy investigation of of the uh, credit collection 
business right. in Chicago. And um, in that investigation, I also got a, uh, I got jobs at maybe four or five different uh, collection agencies, which was at, in the, and this is years ago, but there was no, there were no Illinois laws and no federal laws that regulated that industry. And it was completely out of control. And people were, you know, picking up the phone and they would call a deadbeat that had been identified by an employer. Um, and they would, you know, threaten them with everything from uh, yanking their credit uh to uh visiting them with a certain harm and uh we did that undercover maybe 15 uh, different agencies again unregulated no uh, chicago laws no illinois laws no federal laws and we did about a five-part series it got national attention and uh, uh one of the fellow members of that unit and i subsequently went out to washington and testified and uh, got a federal law uh regulating the collection industry. So, I mean, it worked, but uh, the, the uh, journalism uh, at higher up didn't didn't like the way in which we collected the information. I really remember it's it was like the power of the press. The power of the press. Well, well I mean, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we got you know after the series ran, again, the two of us were. Uh, to, called up by uh, the Senate uh, committee that was in, uh, researching that whole business at the time. And uh, we flew out there and we testified. Um, and ultimately a law was enacted. It was a national law controlling um, you know, the conduct in that industry. Um, so, I mean, it was an effective way of, of getting a certain change. But again, um, the notion of going into a, a, a private company undercover, not disclosing who you are, uh, coming up with a phony name, a phony address, and all that was not looked upon with a great deal of favor by uh, uh, some of the journalism schools, for example. Uh, uh, also, uh, like Pam Zekman when she did the undercover on uh, the uh, city uh, inspector. Oh, oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, so so I worked for Pam and I were on the. Uh, the uh, the four member investigative unit at the Tribune together. She was the director of the task force. I and three others were kind of uh, would work under her uh, um, uh, direction. And um, there was a guy at the this is a long story, but there, there was a guy at the Tribune, uh, George Bliss, famous guy, now deceased. But uh, for years, what he wanted to do with the Tribune task force is uh, go into a tavern and or, or open up a tavern and operate it for maybe four or five months um, or whatever length like of time, just like the task force was Apply doing. Apply for a license. Uh, oh, absolutely. But but uh, and have the city inspectors come in and you know look, look at whether you got a clean operation, you got to get the liquor license, you, you got to get all kinds of approval at various levels from the city of Chicago which was well known in that area under the elder Mr. Daly, and I'm not accusing him of any wrong, but under him there had a, a vast uh, level of corruption had set in in city government. So anyway, Pam wanted to open up a tavern and, and uh, take the readership through all the different- uh, I remember places, the old firehouse. Uh, exactly. So anyway, um, uh, and Pam always wanted to do that at the Tribune, and the Tribune said, "No way, we're not going to we're not going to allow uh, you to operate a, ta a tavern." So ultimately, Pam left the paper, uh, the Chicago Tribune, and she went over to the Chicago Sun Times, and uh, the task force was still in business at that point at the Tribune, and, and she uh, gets three or four people together, employees at the Sun Times. And uh, they open up a tavern. Of course, we we don't know anything about it. And and uh, you know, about a year after operating the tavern, she comes out with about a twenty part series, um, explaining exactly uh, what George Bliss at the Tribune wanted to do himself, but wasn't allowed to do. Wow! A lot of corruption. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Phil Watley, uh, uh, and, and we have D Don Berlin just chimed in, but he said Phil Watley was based at 11th and State, and he managed all the citywide police and mob reporter. Precisely. 
and and Phil was a dear dear friend of mine. He was a wonderful guy. He died very early, but he had been at the um, police headquarters, eleven twenty one South State Street, long since moved. But that used to be the uh, home for the uh, leadership of the Chicago Police Department. Yeah, there was our, yeah, all right. And on the fourth floor, I don't know if you ever got there, but there was a press room. I remember. And, uh, I remember. Uh, well, uh, it's all gone, but there were, you know, four, probably seven or eight uh, reporters would show up each day and they would spend the entire day there reporting on all the shootings there, mayhem that unfolds practically daily in Chicago. And again, would phone it into the rewrite bank. The rewrite man would take all the notes and uh, put, put a story together that was readable and it would go into the paper. But Wally was a wonderful guy, and he knew every <laughs> he knew every plainclothes cop in Chicago practically. He had a sailboat in uh, the park district, and he used to take the uh, the leaders of the, the police department out on it. Uh, Burnham Burn, Burn, Burn Harbor. Yeah, uh, Burnham Harbor. Yeah, yes. a, a beautiful uh, beautiful harbor. But there's about five of them along the lakefront. But Burnham was was clearly the most beautiful. Not far from the police headquarters of that at, in that era, but uh, uh, yeah, Phil would uh, show up daily nine, nine to maybe nine, it depended, and uh, report on all this mayhem that would unfold again <laughs> every every day that the uh, Chicago was in business. Uh, anyhow, so Bill, you touched you touched before on people that. They weren't educated back then. They didn't have to have college degrees. Could you amplify on that, please? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was a younger industry uh, from the get-go, um, you know, r reporters were not necessarily distinguished from the uh, the general population, such as like a medical doctor, for example. You got a medical degree, everybody knows what you do, and they just Presumably, uh, they know what they're doing. Um, in in that era, most of the reporters uh, in Chicago at the time certainly didn't have journalism degrees. And if they had a college degree, it was it wasn't rare, but um, uh, it, it was something that wasn't you know just a, a regular deal. By the time I left the, the Tribune, I'd been there about 22 years. When I left. It was just unbelievable. The whole hiring apparatus had changed. Instead of just hiring a, a milkman, for example, um, who was looking for work, he was thrown out of work, and he heard, heard that they were, they were, the Tribune was looking for a writer. They'd come in, or a reporter. They, they'd come in, they, they might get the job. But, but by the time I left the Tribune, it was clear that the, the industry had completely changed, and they were now focusing 100% on A, college graduates, and more importantly, uh, college graduates in journalism, and more important than that, college graduates who had a master's degree in journalism. And and today, the notion that any uh, newspaper, just about anywhere, but particularly in Chicago, would hire anybody without a journalism degree, is it's just not going to happen. Wow. But it, I mean, it's completely changed, totally what what's your opinion bill as far as you know going back and being that you were uh you know boots on the ground uh undercover uh, you know reporter and all what's your what's your opinion of the news media today well um i think the the biggest change is the fact that um uh, the reporting industry has clearly broken itself down into those uh, who have, have one view from a political standpoint of how a story should be presented and others who might have a different view, but certainly the same, a political kind of thing. Like if I turn on CNN today, I know precisely um, the way in which this news is going to be presented to me, how it's going to be cast. Um, I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't appear to be quite as objective as it was uh, years ago. And um, you didn't go after one party or another party because of their political beliefs, um, or you didn't present you know, an op-ed piece in a certain way because 
you're a conservative. It was just, it was more, the big thing in that era, I'm, I'm telling you, when I arrived, was, you know, objectivity. And, and, and you had a whole, you know, you, after you turned your copy in, you had three or four layers of editors who would look at it before it got final approval and was put in the paper. And what they, the, the key thing in that era was objectivity. Yes. Um, I, we don't want to hear anything about, you know, how you might feel about this, that, or the next thing. Keep the story objective. That's why so, I like John Truman. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, John, John was, John was from the old school. And, um, and uh, I knew John well when I was at City News. I certainly knew him well at the, at the Tribune. Um, but, but John was, played it right down the middle. So, so Don Berlin's asking, uh, uh, if you could tell us about runners like Miles Powers, who was Jack Mabley's chief of staff and, uh, Hanky Grito, yeah. Who was Royko's <laughs> chief of staff? Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, again, in that era, you didn't come in and knock on the door and say, here's why you should hire me. I've got a journalism degree. In that era, uh, you, you went to City News, you, you, had all, you, you hung around a reporter or whatever. Um, it, the, the entire hiring process was different. But So you just tried to break in some kind of way. And one of the best ways to try and break in was going through city news. But if you didn't go through city news, there were other ways. And, and one of them was trying to become a runner for, you know, one of the columnists and Royko, Mike Royko was famous for that. Oh um, yeah. He was standing by all the time. He, morning he, and night. <laughs> he, he had a, a series of them over the years and they would, they would go in, they'd work for him for maybe a year or two and they would do, <laughs> excuse me, they would do all the groundwork for in Royko's case, putting together a column on a certain social issue. Um, they would research it, they would make calls, and then they'd give all the notes, notes for Rico when he put together uh, a column that was unbeatable and unique and, and just unbelievable, and just very, very readable. Um, and syndicated. Uh, but, pardon me? And syndicated. <laughs> it was syndicated? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, syndicated. Yes, it was syndicated. And and yeah. the thing is, when he started out, uh, he had maybe uh, uh, he started out at the Chicago Daily News, which is no longer in business, and um, uh, it was so widely and hotly read in Chicago that they be began to offer it to newspapers across the country. And I think when Lorico died, um, I don't have his little bit in front of me, but. I, I recall reading about the number of papers that, he, that his column would appear in, and it was it was it was startling in that era. I mean, it was hundreds, thousands, thousands, thousands. thousands. yeah, yeah. And um, um, so that was another way of breaking in, but it was a, another way of uh, presenting the news. Um, so, was Chicago a news center at that time? Well, I mean, it was it was a heavy player in in certainly in, in the Midwest, no question about it. Um, but the, the whole business about national news presentation really, really came into sharp focus with the introduction of the internet, which is a whole different thing. But but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was yeah, it was it was a huge news center, no question. Um, but again, uh, most of the news certainly was focused on Chicago, uh, the Midwest, and uh, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, national. Um, but today, as you know, and we all know, uh, you go on the Internet in the morning and uh, uh, you're going to get real-time news sc screaming at you, um, which has had just an incredibly negative impact, as you know, on uh, the historic traditional I think USA today kind of changed that a little bit. Oh, completely. I mean, they have, but they've all they've all changed, uh, and they and they're struggling to survive. And and you know, when the internet came came in initially, um, I, it took. I got to tell you, it took the Tribune uh, many, many, many uh, months to to really come to understand, you know, what a threat it was uh, becoming to the traditional way in which news was presented. 
uh, they didn't know how to deal with it. And to that extent, they they really got caught off guard. The entire industry did. You mentioned something earlier uh, when we were talking about um, uh, the hurricane down in Florida. <laughs> yeah. So what I was going to say. Tell but, our listeners about that, please. Well, so, so the Internet was just coming into being in that era. And, and uh, again, the, the, the captains of the industry didn't quite understand the threat it posed, what it meant, its significance, etc. But what I remember in that era, it was just coming aboard. Um, uh, I went to bed at nine, 10 o'clock at night after the 10 o'clock news, about 1030, and Hurricane, whatever it was, its name was. Hurricane uh, Andrew. Oh, you're, you're right. Okay, yeah. Andrews. It was, it was, you know, 20 miles offshore from uh, Miami. I went to bed. I woke up the following morning, and I looked at the, the morning newspaper. And again, this is, this is pre-internet. I mean, the internet is in business. But I, I didn't have a, a laptop in my house at the time. Um, picked up the newspaper, which had been delivered from 435 North Michigan out to Naperville, 30 miles away, during the night. And I pick it up, and I open it up, and it says, Hurricane Andrews threatens Miami. I turn on uh, the local news, and uh, Hurricane Andrews is in, in uh, New Orleans. It's in Louisiana. I and mean, they wiped out the hurricane center in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, good guy. But I mean, you know, it just, and then, you know, real time, 24 7 news came along. And, and I got to tell you, the, the newspaper, and you, you know this, uh, suffered a huge setback. One of our listeners, Poised for Duty, said that he's, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, all I heard from media people back then is you can't trust the internet. You can only trust us trying to keep people, you know, away from the internet news. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think an awful lot of people were buying that, but, but well, I mean, when it really, when it really came into being, you know, I mean, uh, the average person didn't even know how to operate a, a uh, laptop. There were no laptops. It was just, you know, it was, everybody was trying to figure it out. And, and the newspaper industry, uh, truly, and one must bear in mind that the newspapers are a, a completely different uh, genre. I mean, uh, it's instant news, but, but nobody quite understood how to, how, how to handle this thing uh, in a competitive way with the traditional newspapers. And as a consequence, you know, they, they just got shellacked. And, uh, you know, the big thing in, in, in that era, in that industry, was everybody sat around and waited, waited for the audit of bureau circulation to come up with circulation reports every quarter um, to find out whether the Chicago Sun-Times or the Chicago Tribune uh, was the most widely read n newspaper. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, they'd come out with their report, everybody would run to their newspapers, and they'd see, oh, we're selling 800,000 newspapers a day. Um, uh, but again, to, uh, today, uh, I don't even know if there is an ABC. Um, no, nobody has a real understanding. Well, again, the Tribune used to sell about a million a day, Monday through Friday, 1.2 on uh, Sundays. And today, God, God, God knows what their circulation is. But I've heard reports that it's down around 200,000 a day, something like that. And again, I, I used to see all these Tribune trucks out here 30 miles west of the Loop in Chicago. I haven't seen a truck in months or years. Go ahead. Bill, uh, was there a slant on on the paper? Did, did reporters actually give a slanted opinion to their column? No, no, no. I mean, there was this incredible distinction. For those, right? Yeah, there was this incredible distinction between um the columnist who was conservative the columnist who was liberal and news reporting news reporting was a again you, when i would come back with a story you know i want it right down the middle i'm talking about news i'm not talking about columns G give me the news objective you give it to me straight and if there was any slanting of any kind and it just didn't happen in that era um you know you're uh, i'm sorry it got edited. 
No, absolutely, absolutely, no question about it. But um, you know, today, I mean, clearly, you know, you go to the New York Times, you know what kind of news presentation you're going to get, certainly from certain areas, Washington, um, and uh, you go to uh, the Wall Street Journal, and you're going to get, you know, probably, a, well, it's certainly a different slant. Um, they give a lot of opinions. <laughs> so it's all it's all opinions nowadays. So, Bill, as an investigative reporter, did you ever have uh, any uh, anybody? I would almost say threaten you, but you know, tell you to lay off a business or stay away from a certain story. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would I would get that from time to time. Um, you know, occasionally, uh, believe it or not, we'd get. Uh, uh, security uh, backup of some kind uh, that would come in, uh, come in over the phone anonymously. Um, but yeah, from time to time, that 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 did occur. Fortunately, nobody that I know of got hurt. And did you know of any investigative reporters that did get uh, did get hurt or, or or killed? I mean, in that era in the Chicago with the mob being active. Well, you know, there's there's a famous one back in the '30s, Jake Lingle, but no, I I uh, uh, I was never uh, in my belief that uh, nobody ever came close to you know actually threatening me. Okay. Yeah, so uh, um, Anthony Martini is commenting that uh, you can't even find a newsstand nowadays. A newsstand? Uh, kids no, don't true. even know what a newsstand was. No, no. They're, they're, they were, yeah, I mean, they were up and down all the, the traffic, well-trafficked blocks in Chicago and in the suburbs. It was unbelievable. Even downtown, um, they had uh, the yeah, hikers on the street that would or, or, that was yeah. saying extra, extra. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that is all gone. I mean, again, I, I, on a Sunday, um, you would see caravans of Chicago Tribune 40 trailers hauling the Midwest edition all over the Midwest. And then they'd break it down and then they'd give it to, you know, the drivers would take it out to houses or stores or whatever. Um, on, a, on a Sunday, uh, not only do I not see any uh, Tribune trucks delivering any newspapers, I don't see any newspapers on the front front uh, steps, and I can't find one when I go to Walgreens. It's unbelievable. I, I used as to, a paper boy, as a paper boy back in the early '60s or late '50s, I used to deliver papers to doors and throw them on the driveway on exactly. the porch. Exactly. Hey, no. hey, Red. I was with you on that. I did that in the uh, in the uh, late '80s, early '90s. I was a paper boy. This is a lost art, paper boy. I used to be <laughs> able to get them on the rooftops every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I broke a couple windows, you know. I mean, that's a paper boy. That was that. Was, that that's gone. You can't. There's no. kids don't do that anymore. No, no. But I mean, weapons circulation then. But there's no need, right? I mean, there's yeah. no need for the for the paper boy. Uh, I'm not. I remember getting up at you know four o'clock in the morning and hustling a few papers back at along the North Shore uh, in the fifties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the newsstands are located by the phone booths nowadays. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No phone but, booths anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Oh. Uh, that's that's really interesting. So out of so these undercover uh, uh, invest, I'm sorry, investigative reporting. Did the other newspapers beside the Tribune have similar units that did no. this? No, no, no. And and uh, I got to tell you, you know, when I, when the task force come out with four or five parts, it was classic. It would break on a Sunday where they get 1.2 million readers. This is all pre uh, computer, obviously. Um, and then they would run it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then they'd come back the following Sunday. Um, the Tribune was unique, not only in Chicago, but practically throughout the country with its task force. It was, you know, four people. It was all undercover. And you went into the industry that you had targeted 
very quietly after doing some research and had come to the conclusion that there was a story there and it needed to be told. And so again, we would all get jobs in the industry that we had targeted. And um, uh, we would- we One would, very famous one was the uh, Chicago Credit Authority. The, the Chicago which? Credit Authority. Uh, yeah, that that was that was a good one. I mean, I you know I I, I worked uh, undercover uh, as a uh, bill collector for that series for in you know, about uh, five or six different uh, outlets. <coughs> I mean, uh, bill collectors, and uh, you know we came up with a five part series. But the one I, I would like to mention very briefly is uh, the one that won the Pulitzer. And um, it was back in the a long time ago. It was in the mid seventies, and uh, again we had I identified two hospitals in Chicago that were privately owned, and they were smaller hospitals. One was on the south side, two hundred and fifty beds. One was on the north side, two hundred and fifty beds. Each of the hospitals were owned by uh, individuals or family family owned. And what in my in the hospital that I specifically investigated uh, and went into as a patient, um, we had identified uh, that hospital as collecting uh, welfare recipients, people who they the people who they, they knew, the hospitals knew, uh, were uh, certified uh, recipients from the welfare department in Illinois. Then they would. They what they had done is they had um, uh, entered into private contracts with maybe 15 uh, private ambulances all along, in my case, all along on the north side. These fleets of private ambulances would go out and sweep up people off the street uh, who were drunk, passed out, or whatever. They'd bring them back to the hospital. Um, well, I take that back. They would first check to see if the person was getting Medicaid from the state of Illinois. And if that party was had a Medicaid card on him, they would put him in the ambulance, take him to the uh, uh, back deck of the uh, hospital. The hospital would accept that person in and they'd put him in the hospital for 21 days. That was the maximum amount that Medicaid would repay the hospital for that 21 day stay. Um, so I went into a real, real rundown uh, <laughs> hotel. Um, I mean, a really a flea joint. And, and uh, uh, it was frequented by uh, inebriates all up and down the, the street. <laughs> so so, so I, I went in there and I got a room. And um, I took a swig out of a whiskey bottle um, as I was being uh, admitted to the, hot, or to the uh, hotel. And uh, the desk clerk looked at me and he said, uh, you know, uh, I think you need a little rest. How would you like to spend a couple of days in a hospital? <laughs> and I said, well, why would I want to do that? And he said, well, you know, you, you, you need free food. You get a little rest. I mean, when's the last time you had a good rest? I said, well, it's been a while. And the guy says, well, I'm, I'll get you up to the hospital. I said, well, I'll give it a try. He says, you got a Medicaid card? I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, let me see it. So I show it to him and he says, all right, that's a deal. I'll call him up. How would you like to go tomorrow? I said, you're in. So I went upstairs, checked in, <clears throat> went to my room, spent the night not in that hotel. Um, and the following morning, got up very, very early, went to the hotel, pretended I was in the room. A knock comes on the door. Two ambulance drivers are there. They lead me back to the uh, ambulance, got the, uh, the uh, light going on the ambulance. They put me in the back of the ambulance. They turn on the siren, and um, off I go to the hospital. And now I was—I could have stayed 21 days, and there's no way I was going to do that. But I stayed three days, and my boss finally stopped by one day, pretending to be a friend, and says, "Will you get the frig out of here?" And I said, "Yeah, okay." So after three days, I went uh, went out, and we we wrote. Uh, um, a very, very uh, good report. Still there. You go up on Tribune, uh, uh, the back copies, and, and you can get a copy of it. Anyhow. So uh, how many Pulitzers was... did you win? I'm sorry? How many Pulitzers did you win? One. 
Could you tell us okay. about the the investigation that resulted to, uh, resulted in you getting this uh, the biggest award for journalism? Precisely, precisely. But but while I was in the Northside Hospital acting as a patient, another member of the four member unit uh, task force got a job as a janitor in in the other hospital on the south side of Chicago. And while he didn't get in there, you know, to, to examine what kind of, uh, uh, well, he, he went in there as an employee. So, so when, when he finished with the employee and I finished as a patient, you know, we came back to the task force. We put together a four, five-part series, and that won the Pulitzer. Because the minute, the minute those, uh, that story broke on that Sunday in the mid-'70s, <coughs> Mayor Daly, uh, was very irritated, and he, oh, shut, yeah. <laughs> he shut both shut the, both hospitals down. And one now is a, uh, um, a, a a museum, I think, of Lithuania on the south side, <laughs> and, and and the one on the north side was sold to another hospital years ago. <laughs> was that Northwestern that bought it? Uh, uh, no, no, no. It was uh, you know, I, I don't. No, it was. I think it was a, a hospital. It was a large hospital in Chicago that that bought uh, Northwest Community, which is the hospital. Right. That, That's the one that I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in Northwest Community, and after the story broke, uh, the the guy who owned it wound up uh, selling it to uh, the, 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 another hospital. Did you ever touch on Irv Weiner and the uh, his Medicare fraud? At the hospital? Um, no, no. Um, I think I may have written about him, but but no, in connection with that investigation, uh, I had no dealings with Weiner, but boy, I, I knew that guy. Uh, did I ever? Uh, I knew him quite well myself. <laughs> the, oh, God. A bit, Bill, oh. could, could you tell us about Phil Watley's series on the steering dead bodies from accidents on the Dan Ryan to Chicago police squad roles who steered them into funeral homes? Yeah, it, we, it, with, with Phil, you know, it was kind of a different concept, but like all other reporters in that era and that paper, I mean, nobody, nobody uh, really did four and five part series. That was put, pretty much put up to, uh, uh, the, to the task force. But uh, Phil, uh, you know, would check in at 11th and state every morning, police headquarters. And uh, he knew every reigning captain uh, in the department. They all knew him. Um, and he would get the, he would get these tips. And, and one tip that he got was that, uh, that you know, there were people uh, uh, sitting next to the busy highways in Chicago waiting for a crash to occur. And, or they were monitoring the airwaves, police airwaves. Uh, listening to uh, police reports, um, and they would a uh, crash would occur, and they would arrive at the scene, and um, uh, many of them would identify as uh, Chicago policemen, and and uh, they would get a full report on somebody who had been involved in the crash, and uh, they would take all that information back to the the lawyer that they were working for at the time, and the lawyer would uh, examine you know what had actually happened and if well, he called the, the person involved in the ca crash, the, the victim, and uh, try and get a lawsuit going. And if there was a settlement of some kind, um, the investigator, uh, the investigator uh, who, who tipped off the, the lawyers uh, would get a cut of the action. And, and Phil did a lot of reporting in that area about that concept. Wow. Wow. But, but there was never, uh, uh, you know, sustained undercover probe that really gave a, a, a new word called ambulance chasers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. definitely uh, gives a new meaning to that so be, being that you're an investigative journalist what do you think of project veritas Uh, now, which one is that, Project Veritas? Project Veritas is the one that goes into uh, all these different uh, campaigns, right? Which are usually oh, oh, oh. and 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 exposes the you know the the politicians. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I got to tell you, I have uh, it's, it's kind of a different reporting, and I, I, d- I have not paid a great deal of attention to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to the extent that I have, um, and I may have this not completely right, sounds like they're doing some some pretty good stuff. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Well, they, I mean, they go undercover and they get into these uh, different. Oh uh, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. Diff- get yeah, different yeah. jobs in the different headquarters and you know try and catch them on uh you know hidden cameras saying different oh things. that's right that's right that's what they um, do really well you know um i, I look back on, on that era of undercover reporting and and uh at my age <laughs> and my maturation i have a slightly different view of the matter <laughs> but uh when i was there i gotta tell you it was the uh it was a slice of life <laughs> if i'm not mistaken uh you guys did things like on operation gambit and other things that were going on in chicago like gray lord and all different kinds of things that were political yeah great gray lord was a huge huge story major and and yeah and and at, by the time <clears throat> operation gray lord became evident to the general public. Uh, I was then covering the federal building in Chicago, the federal court building. <laughs> and and uh, I became imminently familiar with their prosec, what that investigation entailed. And it was truly, truly incredible. Um, uh, the, the, the government wound up indicting after the entire investigation was over, indicting and convicting nearly a hundred uh, court personnel, mainly defense attorneys. Not and, only that, but they got police officers in the hallways. <laughs> oh no, no, you're right, you're right. They they had police officers. They had a couple of lawyers. Uh, I mean, a bunch of lawyers. Um, they, but they, 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 yeah, they were all court personnel. But then I, you know, I covered those those uh, cases. And I'm telling you, the the fraud was immense, and and uh, uh, the, the injustice that, that, that unfolded as a consequence of the corruption was just unbelievable. I mean, there were judges involved. There were 30 or 40 judges, as a matter of fact. Now that I think about it, um, who who were uh, knowingly, willingly uh, taking cash payments from. Uh, criminal defense attorneys in order to get their uh, their case uh, thrown out. Oh, yeah. I think the most famous one that I know about that was mob-connected was Harry Ailman. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I and Judge the, Wilson. Oh, Judge Wilson, yeah. And Bobby Co- Bob Cooley. Yes, yes, yeah. Um. I mean, it was it was, it was an incredible. Uh, it went uh, about two years. I think it was undercover for maybe two years, and then the consequent uh, indictments and trials was another two years. Uh, it, it went on forever. But again, by that time, I was assigned over to the federal building. I was no longer doing investigations, and uh, all these indictments played out and these trials, and uh, uh, you know the major major. Uh, court in Chicago is, is at 26 in California, the criminal courts building, and uh, the cases that, that came out of there because of Grey Lord was just unbelievable. I mean, there were murders, shootings, um, the, the, just the worst kind of uh, corruption. I mean, uh, extortion, everything. Yeah, yeah, it was all there, and and these these uh, defense attorneys and these uh, various uh, court personnel. Um, would take the cash and do what was needed to get these people uh, relief. Yeah, that was. As they said, the politicians and the police were the finest the money could buy. <laughs> I think there's something to be said about that. Um, it's the truth in Chicago, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, well. Bill, this has been awesome talking with you, and I want to thank you again for uh, spending uh, spending some time this afternoon and uh, and taking questions from us and from the uh, from our viewers. Everybody, everybody's been commenting. I know you're not 
maybe you are looking at a screen with this. Uh, uh, I am not. No, okay. Everybody's commenting though in the side comments. They really, really enjoyed uh, enjoyed listening to you and all of uh, all your stories. And uh, in, in, it's just a fascinating. It's a fascinating life that you've had, and it's fascinating to talk to somebody who actually used to report the news. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, you really want to get to the bottom of things, you know, and, and and get the real story, not you know their opinion of the story. No, no, you're right, you're right, and it's changed dramatically. Yeah, it's a lot uh, of people are thanking you. And the comments right. on the side of this, a lot of people are thanking you for coming right. on the show. Yeah, we had over a hundred people sitting here today listening, so it's uh, terrific. It, it it was a lot of fun though, and. uh but we uh we are running out of time today, and every good thing Fair must enough. must come to an end. So thanks so much, uh, uh Bill, for for coming on. And uh, and uh, would you would you consider uh, doing doing uh, an interview in the future with us again? No, absolutely. I'd be wow. happy to. That'd be that would be great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you thank from you from all of our listeners. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon uh, talking to us. Bill. Appreciate and it. You have a great rest of your uh, day and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. And don't you get too, too cold with much. that God snow. Thanks, God. God bless. Bye bye. Okay, Red, are you still there? Let me come back to my mic. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me hang up my phone here. Hold on. Let me turn your mic on. Let's not get any feedback. Are you there, Red? Okay, I'm here. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, uh, yeah, I can hear you. You can't hear me? Oh, no? Is my mic muted? No. You should be able to hear me. Turn your speakers on. Turn your speakers on. <laughs> Red turned off his speakers before the show started. That was so, it. There we go. <laughs> We had to get everything worked out so we didn't have feedback going. Anyway, uh, did you? I enjoyed that, Red. That was that was really interesting hearing from him. He's a and, hell of a man. He really is. I mean, that's that is super uh, awesome. And uh, even Greg said that you did great today. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I thought that was a lot of fun. So uh, you're welcome, Don Chichio Di Porzalo. Glad that you enjoyed that. Uh, and guys, be sure to tell Don Berlin thank you because he's the one who made all that just happen. And all that happened in the last 48 hours. This is because of you guys. So it was a, um, it was a crunch to put it together. <laughs> right. And uh, one more, one more quick shout out. If Steve Crockett, if Steve Crockett is listening, could you please send me an email or uh, call our um, uh, our uh, line here, 702-677-9015. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, on the bottom of the screen right there. And uh, you guys can you guys see the number. Steve Crockett, if you are listening, please call or send an email to adam at vegasspecialtytours.com. Um, somebody's looking to get a hold of you. So they called me and asked me to uh, do a shout out and see if you're around listening. Uh, maybe you could call and I could pass some information along to you. So uh, street stories, uh, Anthony, the logistics of getting the communication worked out is impressive, Adam. Hey, Anthony, I'm serious. I bought this, this Zoom track four with the inputs so I could bring the phone into this and have different, you know, I, it only records. It doesn't, you can't, it's not a live switcher. So I'm going to have to go get the more expensive one, which is a live switching board. And then I can bring the phone. In. But I'll tell you what, the, the speaker phone, this is a little tip for you guys. Speaker phone sounds tinny. So I have this Bose portable speaker, which has a nice lot of bass in it. And so you get more full range. So setting it next to the microphone worked just fine, I think. So I think you guys thought so because y'all stuck around and listened, so it must have sounded okay. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, the hospital scam was pretty good. G money, glad you enjoyed. G money, all of this. Huh? yeah, <laughs> yeah, and thanks for uh, joining the channel, G money. I appreciate that. Uh, so, so with all that said, Red, what do you say? Call it a day. Uh, you might. That's a good idea. It's been an hour. Everybody's kind of been hanging around. So, um, guys, it's uh, it's been fun. Red, thank you very much again. 
I'm going to go to an after party. You're doing an after party? All right. I, I'll probably jump in and join you too. So guys, if you want to check it out, go to Red's channel. Probably be up in five minutes. Okay. A little after party. We'll see you guys there. And uh, it's been fun. Mob vlog. Mob vlog.